Well, it's good to be with you. We're going to be continuing our series on looking at character, godly character. I thank Howard and Ted Boodle for sharing and filling in while I was away. I hear wonderful reports, so thank you, gentlemen, for that. We're going to take our Bibles, turn to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. It says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. And your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and our hearts today. And as we look at this topic of money and our attitude toward it, pray, O oh Lord, that we would allow, it to, allow our hearts to see that it kind of reflects what's going on deep within us. And how we need you to be Lord of all of our lives, including this area. And so, Father, just help us and guide us and strengthen us, we ask in your name. Amen. Our theme really for the fall has come out of 2 Peter verse 3, 11, where he asks the question, what kind of people ought you to be? What kind of people ought you to be? He says you ought to live holy and godly lives. And I wonder, how does this show up in my attitude toward money? We need money. It's the currency. If we buy and sell, we need to have money of some kind. Here it's dollars. In Albania, it's lek. But we need currency in order to have these transactions. So what is our attitude? And, and how does that attitude toward money reflect a godly character within my heart and my life? I've just returned home from Albania. It's one of the poorest countries in Europe where the minimum salary is $220 Canadian a month. And some people are working for even less than that if they're in a sewing, they're sewing in a seamstress place for $150 Canadian a month. You wonder, how on earth can anyone make it, and how can they go for? I have some pictures here of some, some uh, just, just idea of what's going on in that nation. Everyone I talk to seems to have the dream of coming to Canada. They say, how do you like Albania? I said, it's wonderful. Oh, good. We want to come to Canada. We want to get out of this place because it's so difficult for them to get ahead in life. However, for the majority of people, it's just not possible. There's not a lot of jobs there. Every day, men stand on the side of the road with shovels hoping that somebody will stop by and pick them up and remind me of that parable that Jesus told where he goes and he grabs the men into work in the vineyard and goes back and the men are standing around. Well, that's what ha is happening on the streets of Albania. Those with regular employment are very grateful for their jobs, especially those that are working with the, with the daycares or the preschools that are involved in the ministry. Uh, there's a lot of staff driving uh, children here and there, and they're very, very thankful for the jobs that they have. But almost every Christian ministry that we were connected to or that we were introduced to in Albania or even in Kosovo where we had also gone needed outside support from those either in Europe or in, in North America. And as I thought about this message and I thought about a Christian's attitude towards money, I'm mindful that the truths that we look at today have to apply to believers here in Canada just as much as they are applied to believers in Albania. And so how does one honor the Lord with one's wealth? Well, some in Albania would say, I don't have any wealth, but that's not true. We have been entrusted by God with something. And so how do we take that which we've been entrusted, whether it be large or whether it be small, and how do I make sure that I'm honoring him? How do I make sure that, that the Christian character of my heart is showing through in my attitude towards money? And so let's look at a few things. The first thing is that we tithe. He says, bring the first fruits. Now, I was a little shocked as I was sitting in staff meeting and, and to realize that one of the requirements for those that work in the ministry is that they tie to the church that they go to and that they're involved in an area of ministry. And if they don't tie, then they're not involved in an area of ministry. They can't work for the foundation. How many would like that in your employment? If your boss said, by the way, you can't keep your job unless you tie." And it's interesting, as, as the staff were talking about this, how they were uh, not, not racking against that, but they were saying, oh, we're so thankful that we work for a place that believes in tithing and it asks us to do the same. 
And I was thinking about in Canada, people wouldn't be responding that way at all. But in Albania, it's part of their culture that they say we want to give back to God. And I was thinking, is it really fair to ask people who are struggling to make ends meet, give back to the Lord? Is it really fair to say to those that are, who are making a wage that, that, that is so small compared to what we would have here in Canada? Is it really fair to say and expect that they give back to God? J.R. Kraft said, the only investment I've ever made which constantly, or, in, in, or, sorry, paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I have given to the Lord. Pastors do their greatest service in leading men to understand the truth of God concerning the stewardship of time and money. So I guess J.R. Kraft would be proud of my topic today. But what is it then that he saw? What is it that he wanted pastors to talk about? Why is this so important to him? And why is it so important to the believers in Albania that they give back to God of the little that they have? Well, I wonder if it's because tithing is really a lordship issue. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And by bringing a tenth of your income, we remind ourselves who is Lord of our life. We remind ourselves that Jesus is Lord of our life. And that he is the one that, that informs us how we are to spend the money that has been entrusted to our hearts. We declare you are first in my life. As we bring the first fruits, it's almost a symbolic thing of saying, yes, Lord, you are first in my life. And all that I have, Lord, is yours. And therefore, I have a responsibility before you to be a good steward of all that you've entrusted to me. But it's also a faith issue. And maybe not as much for us in Canada, but I tell you, for the people in Albania, it is a faith issue as they bring their tithe of the little bit that they have. Think the first fruits of the paycheck. They bring that and give it back to the Lord. And while they do that, it's almost like they activate their faith and say, oh Lord, I know that you can meet my other needs. I know, Lord, I have confidence that you can do more with that 90% than I could do with 100% all by myself. And sometimes it can be difficult for us to give back to God, especially when our income is small. But it does declare our faith in God. Not only a little lordship thing, but a faith issue. Lord, I trust you. I believe you. I know that you can meet my needs according to your riches and glory. John D. Rockefeller said, I have tithed on every dollar that God has entrusted to me. And I want to say to you that I never could have tithed on my first million if I had not tithed on my first salary, which was $1.50 a week. The point he's trying to make is this principle applies no matter what the salary is. The principle of saying, Lord, I give you Lordship in my life, and I trust that you are able to meet all my needs according to your riches and glory. But it's also something more. It's an act of worship and love. You see, when we give back to the Lord, we acknowledge with thanksgiving God's grace and provision in our lives. We say, oh Lord, I am blessed, and I know that I am blessed. I'm not only blessed because I am in relationship with you, but I'm also blessed because there's provision in my life. Corinthians says, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, and it's something about that that I was struck in the staff meeting when we were talking about this. And part of me kind of railed as a Canadian to, to that legislative giving. Because I thought, well, does that take away the joy of giving, the heart of giving? You know, because that, that would be my heart. I don't want this to be duty. I want this to be joy. I want this to be... But then as I listened to them, I, I realized that it, there was joy. There was joy in their heart. And, and I had to ask myself, is it my joy to give? Do I rejoice in God's provision in my life? Do I count it a joy to give back to God? Or is it just a legalistic thing? 
Because if it becomes duty and legalism, it loses something. There's something lost within the depths of my soul and my heart. Have you ever watched a child give an adult a present? This week, we're so glad that Caitlin is here with Brooklyn, and, and it was Caitlin's birthday, and so we had a little birthday party, and, and there was a present there that, that Kaylee had wrapped, and she had bought a, a gift for Caitlin out of her own money, and, and, uh, and she made a card, and a homemade card, and then in the card, a, a quarter popped out. And Caitlin said, well, what's with the quarter? And uh, Caitlin had, because it's so difficult to bring stuff back on the plane, just ask for money. And Katie heard about that. And so she wanted to give Auntie Caitlin some money. And she said, well, that's all I had. I went and all I had was a quarter, but I wanted to give you all I had. And I thought, do I give to God like that? Do I, do I have a heart that says to God, Lord, I love you so much, and I honor you so much. Lord, I just want to give to you with joy and abandonment. Is there a purity about my giving? I really hope that there is, because I think regardless of whether I make a large wage or a small wage, when I give back to God with such purity and with such love and with such devotion, I think that there's an aspect of the character of the heart that God says, I am honored by that. And then we earn with integrity. That's something that's really important to God. He says, the Lord abhors dishonest scales, but accurate weights are his delight. And God is really concerned about how we earn our money as well. Now, recently, the government of Albania has been cracking down on businesses because so many people have little businesses and they're not licensed with the government. And of course, the government is cracking down. And so they're requiring every business to have a cash register that they might keep track of all the transactions that are brought. And apparently, uh, too many businesses were charging the people one price, but re uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, reporting another to the government and therefore avoiding paying taxes. In fact, it, it was, we were told that when you go into a restaurant, you needed to ask for the receipt, the cash receipt, because if you came out of the restaurant and one of the government bureaucrats came to you and said, by the way, do you have a receipt for the meal that you just ate? And if you say, no, I don't, they can fine you. That's how they're taking things in, in, the, in that country because they're making sure that everybody has a receipt. In fact, we met some people that couldn't afford a cash register and had to shut their businesses down for the time being. And so it, it's difficult. They're, they're kind of in a catch-22. They're barely making a living, but they're having uh, some difficulty with it. Well, we, we know that uh, there's just those people that are doing that. Well, many times in the, in the book of Proverbs, God talks about dishonest scales and how much he dislikes them. And if our thirst for wealth, our thirst for gain is so great that we're willing to lie or to cheat or to fudge the books, to cut corners, then I think we're in danger of failing to honor the Lord with our wealth. We might feel good, oh, I, I, I avoided paying taxes, but, but is that what honors the Lord with our wealth? No, he asks us to earn with integrity. And regardless of where one lives, one can earn a wage with integrity. We can put in a full day's wage for a full day's pay. And God honors that. Besides, Proverbs says, better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. You know, God is never honored when we compromise our integrity to get ahead financially. In his book, Character Matters, Mark Rutland tells a story of a Scotsman who's traveling on an English train. The conductor comes to him and uh, asks for his ticket. Of course, the Scotsman didn't buy a ticket. He says, I refuse to pay it. It costs too much. The conductor says, what do you mean? The po price is posted right here. And you knew that before you got on the train. If you don't pay your ticket, I will put you off the train. I want you to cut it in half. The Scotsman said. Well, they argued and argued back and forth until finally the conductor was so frustrated. He said, I'll fix you. He took the man's suitcase, rolled down the window, threw the suitcase off the train, and the train was just crossing a bridge and into the river at the time. The Scotsman screamed, what's the matter with you, man? Not only do you want to steal my money, but now you've drowned my only son. It's just a joke. 
jet lag. <laughs> but you know, we, we, God is not honored when we try to get ahead in a manner that does not have integrity. Then we are asked to spend wisely. Proverbs says, he who loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and oil will never be rich. Verse 20 says, in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. Now, Albania was a little bit unique in the fact that Albania doesn't accept credit cards. There's a few places that might accept credit cards, but the vast majority of businesses you go to, they don't accept credit cards. Most transactions are cash only. Not Canadian cash, but Albanian lack. So earlier in the week, we exchanged some of our Canadian dollars for Albanian lek. But as the week was going on, my, my Albanian lek was getting lower. And of course, you debate, you trade more in, but you can't spend anywhere else. So you kind of just manage your money. And one day, Pastor Bob Webster, who pastors in Calgary, and I were walking out uh, for a walk on our final Saturday. Pastor David Panoyer was exhausted. He went to bed and we figured we would at least redeem a few of the hours. And, and so we were enjoying ourselves. And as we were walking uh, in the main promenade of town, we bumped into the, some of the young people from church and uh, they wanted us to join them. So we were doing that. We were joining them, having a wonderful evening. And Bob and I were talking about treating them to some ice cream. Well, there was 10 of us. And we're thinking... And I said to Bob, I wonder if I got enough lek. One of the kids heard it. They started laughing. They, they felt it was kind of funny. But I thought it would be, I thought it would be pretty embarrassing if all of a sudden we, we pull out our wallets, we pull out this money, and we don't have enough. Albania, we have to say to the kids who don't have hardly any money, by the way, do you have any money? Well, thankfully, we had enough. But it really forced us to spend wisely. Here in Canada, we don't have to worry about it as much, do we? Because we just pull out that credit card. And I think we, we have to be careful in our spending that, that it, we just don't always pull the credit card. Now, if you're paying it off every month, okay, wonderful. But the problem comes when we begin to spend more than we make. And then we get behind. I often say to couples that are getting married, if I gave you $10,000, well, how far would it go? Well, they might be able to get a car. It might help a little bit. But $10,000 isn't a lot. But now say you owe me $10,000. How difficult is that? Especially when you're, you're, you're making money and, and you're spending almost everything you have and now out of that little bit that you haven't spent, you need to pay me back. It's so difficult and we need to spend wisely and we need to honor the Lord in how we spend. If we believe that we'll only be happy when we get the new couch or the new dress or the new cell phone, then we're in trouble. By the way, Albania, being a poor nation, has, has, has caught up to us as far as technology. All the young people have, have cell phones and internet uh, and all of those things. But you know, in Canada, our debt level is beginning to rise because we don't restrain ourselves in our spending. And I wonder if unrestrained spending shows a character quality that honors God. Sometimes we just need to restrain ourselves you know, we, 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 we kind of knew, by the way, that we were going to buy these kids the ice cream, and we were kind of a little marketplace, and, and there was something, I was thinking about buying it, but I knew if I bought it, I didn't have money for ice creams. So you kind of had to make that choice, and you know, life kind of does that, and sometimes we just need to spend wisely in what we do. When one of the vans of the mission wasn't working properly, I think I have, there's the mechanic shop up there, that was something very interesting too. But one of the vans wasn't working properly. The drivers were really wanting the mission to buy a brand new one instead of opting to repair it. It's always easier to spend someone else's money, I've found. And even though it would have been wonderful to get them a brand new van, and to be fair, they really do need another van. They're running with two vans, and they borrow a van from another ministry, and they really need three. But uh, we, we, we opted to uh, go with the prudent thing and fix this one instead, at least for the time being. Uh, because the money didn't have money to buy a new one. They're saving to buy that extra one that they're going to need. And uh, just a wise decision. Proverbs 13 verse 18 says, He who ignores discipline comes to poverty and shame, but whoever heeds correction is honored. You know, under communism, uh, Albania was very isolated from the world. One guy said, we were, so, we, we, were, we were isolated and we were told that we were the best nation in all of Europe, that no one was as good off as we were. 
And then all of a sudden, communism fell, and uh, they began to have cell phones, internet towers, and they became aware of what was going on around them. That's why they all want out of Albania now. And there is a desire within their heart to keep up with the Joneses. In fact, one guy wanted to buy a car. And uh, everyone drives Mercedes over there, which you think, poor people driving Mercedes. I think what happens is they steal them from Europe and they sell them on the black market. And that's how everyone's driving Mercedes. And their older vehicles, uh, all their, their uh, what's that yard where you buy all the used stuff? Their, what's that called? scrapyard the, is all old Mercedes, but that's what they're driving. And one young guy thought he was going to buy a Mercedes. Thankfully, someone in the church sat him down and said, you realize how much it costs? Fuel there uh, costs about $1.79 a liter uh, fuel there. So you're thinking making $220 a month, fuel is $1.79 a liter. Anyway, so they sat down with this guy, and they figured that he could get the car, but he couldn't drive it because he couldn't afford the gas. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's just we need to spend wisely, and we need to honor the Lord in what we're doing and what we're spending. Jesus actually says this. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't think Jesus was so much concerned about how much money is in your wallet as he is in the attitude of your heart as he speaks these words. Basically, he's asking me, he's asking you, what do you delight in? What is your delight? Is it material things or is it heavenly things? Does our worth come from having stuff or does our worth come from our relationship with Jesus Christ? We met some people that, in terms of Canadian standards, would not have had a whole lot. But they had joy, and they had peace, and they had an excitement and a faith in Jesus Christ. Mark Rutland tells about a couple in his church who were leaving for vacation right after the morning service. They showed up in the evening service. He says, well, did you change your mind? They said, no, our air conditioning wasn't working, and it was too hot to drive with the windows up. He said, well, why didn't you just drive with the windows down and fix it later? Are you joking? <laughs> drive with the windows down? People might think we can't afford air conditioning. <laughs> and they gave up their whole holiday because of what people might think. If we're buying stuff, if we're buying things, especially things we can't afford to impress people we don't know, then we might have an issue that we need to talk to Jesus about. Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Better a meal of vegetables where love is than the fattened calf with hatred. The last thing about this honoring the Lord with my wealth and allowing my attitude toward money to really reflect a heart that says I love you, God, I think is generosity. Generosity. Proverbs chapter 3 says, Do not hold good from those who deserve it when it is your power to act. Corinthians says, Remember this, whoever, spares, uh, sorry, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. On my last day in Albania, I had done the staff devotions, and uh, they were saying we had prayed together, and, and they said, Well, when are you arriving home? And I said, Well, 24 hours from now. They were like, Wow, it was a long journey. But just before we had about a half hour, one of the guys said, we, we have to go for coffee. Well, at this point, I, I put my hand in my pocket, and at this point, I had only coins. And I had enough, I knew, I had enough luck I could buy coffee, but I couldn't buy anything for me. I just, I, I was out of money. So I was, I, I found their espresso a little bit too strong for me anyway, and so I was quite content just to let him have some coffee, and I would just let him talk to me. Well, he looked at me and says, well, you have to have something. And I said, well, no, I don't have to have something. I, I'm quite content. He goes, no, I invited you and I have to pay. That's just the way it is. So you have to have something. So I had my, my Coca-Cola. But you know, he had a generous heart. He had a generous heart. He might not have had a lot, but he had a generous heart. David Ramsey, who is a financial consultant, says, I do not totally understand what giving does to the human spirit, 
but I know that I've met very few well-balanced, happy, healthy, wealthy people who do not give money away. See, when we invest in others, there's something that happens. When we invest in our children and our grandchildren, that keeps us from being selfish. It allows us to be unselfish. When we invest in missions and, and caring for the poor and, and helping others, we invest in eternity. Proverbs 19 verse 17 says, He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward him for what he has done. Now, of course, this requires wisdom. That's why we need to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, because there's so many needs out there. Sometimes there's more needs than what we can handle. So we're in Albania, and of course, on the street, there's always people begging. Maybe somebody that's laying there with a cast begging. Maybe there's, there's always someone begging. Children are coming up to you recruiting uh, what they can. Uh, they're recruited because of heartstring thing. In fact, one fellow was telling me that there was these kids, they were so cute, and, and he had real heart for them. The next day he went back with, with some clothes for this little one and said, well, where is that boy? Oh, he's been transferred to Paris. So sometimes we, we don't, it's, it's not as pure as what we think it is. The missionary David Penoyer said, you see that woman sitting there? Yes, all the children bring her the money and they do very well. They're connected to the mafia. So what does the church do? Because there is great need. Well, instead they do something else. They provide food bags for needy families. They provide hot meals for all the kids that come to the to the preschools. Years ago, they, they opened up the church and they would have a feeding program that they fed children breakfast and lunch and whoever wanted to come would come in. And many of the young leaders that are leading the church today on their leadership team have become Christians through that feeding program. They grew up in a Muslim home. They grew up in, in a home that was poor but, and they couldn't afford meals. And so they would come to the church and receive something for their belly, but they received something much more. They received something for their heart and for their spirit. And it reminded me not just how, much, how, how blessed we are, but how important it is that we care for those in need with great wisdom and with great compassion. It's amazing how many stories of people we talk to about their story, how many people in Albania came to know the Lord because they were impacted by the kindness of a Christian through generosity. And that's what reached into their heart and love and touched them with the message of Christ. But it was because of generosity. And of course, then when we are generous with wisdom, God is honored. One of the ladies we met in Kosovo uh, during the war with, she was uh, in Kosovo during the war with Serbia, you remember that. The Kosovo resistance army operated from her house in the neighborhood, and there is her house, I believe. This one here, there's a red car, her house is right there. Well, the Serbs were coming in and, and uh, they were going to do ethnic cleansing, and so this family was, was trying to flee flee into Albania, but they ran into a Serbian checkpoint. When asked for their address, the soldiers determined that they were terrorists because they came from this neighborhood. Her husband was immediately arrested and put into prison. She and her children were gathered up, put into a munitions bunker. NATO was planning to bomb that, that night. They were going to be basically human shields. All they could do was take bed sheets and wave them out the windows in desperation, hoping that some satellite might see they're, they're waving that there's people in this building and not bomb them to death. Thankfully, NATO didn't bomb the building. The next night, the army came in and, and boarded up all the windows so they couldn't even do that. Well, obviously, intelligence on NATO's side realized that there were still people in the building and they didn't bomb the building. In frustration, they sent the women home. They weren't allowed to go to Albania where they would flee. They had been sent home. Their home had been ransacked. She was in constant fear. All the valuables, of course, had been taken. She was a school teacher. Every book in the home was taken away. She was afraid. She could hardly sleep uh, because she was afraid the soldiers would burst into her home and, and take her or her children away. There was many women who were, who were taken away and brought into brothels and used by the men. And of course, so she lived in constant fear. She said she was, she was a zombie. I think she's probably experiencing some post-traumatic syndrome. And she was hardly functioning. And then one day, there was a package of food left outside her door. And it contained this beautiful 
book. There's a picture of it there. She discovered later that it was from a Christian ministry who were told by the Serbian army that they could drop the food off as long as they didn't talk to anyone because all the people that were living there are Muslims and she was a Muslim woman. As a Muslim woman, she had never seen a Bible but soon found herself drawn to it and she began to read it. And as she read it, she was struck by the contrast between it and the Koran. The Koran told her to hate her enemies but this one told her to love her enemies and to forgive. Part of her really wanted to hate, especially when her husband was still in prison and, and hearing about all the things that were happening around her. But she knew that if she did, that the cycle of her children would be so devastating for them and they would grow up in a way that she did not want them to grow up with that kind of hatred and that kind of uh, prejudice and that kind of vengeance and bitterness of heart and soul. There was an address there that she could go to and she went and sat down with these, these ladies. They were, they were Christian ladies. And as she sat down, she said it was almost like everything that was down in depths of my heart just broke and she began to sob. The ladies just hugged her and loved her. And they introduced her to Jesus. Now she's the children's pastor. At this church that we're visiting, there's a picture of her there. She introduces children to Jesus. They have outreaches that, that reach hundreds of thousands of children in that place. They have connection with a church out in St. Louis. I'll talk a little bit more about it tonight. But none of it would have happened. None of it wouldn't have happened if there wasn't a group of Christians that said, listen, there are some Muslim women who are going through hell. Their husbands have been taken they are left desolate and they need our help. And we can show them the love of Jesus, and they did. None of it would have happened if they would have just left them alone. Generosity smothered in prayer was used of God in a very powerful way. A man once had a dream that he went to heaven. And uh, while he was walking with Peter, they came upon a mansion and he thought, oh, is that mine? And uh, Peter said, no, sorry. Uh, they saw another one. He said, well, is that one mine? And Peter said, no, uh, no, sorry. Well, well, where's mine? Peter said, well, just follow me. And so he followed him. He went around the bend, and, and there was a little tiny shack, and, and Peter said, here it is. Well, you don't expect me to spend all eternity there, do you? He says. He says, well, it's all we could do with what you sent ahead. Do you believe that God the character is reflected in our attitudes toward money? Is my attitude toward money, does it reflect my love for Jesus and my desire to honor him? Proverbs says, honor the Lord with your wealth. My trip to Albania has reminded me just how blessed we really are in this nation. In fact, we have more than most people around the world. And yet, even in Albania, I saw how believers honored the Lord with their wealth. They tithed. They earned with integrity. They spend wisely. Well, for the most part. They're just like us. Some are, some are having some struggles, just like some of us. But for the most part, they're spending wisely. And they're generous. We were visiting one home and uh, we admired the grapes that they grew in their yard. This was out in the outlying villages within the town, and I'll show you tonight in some pictures. Uh, in the town, it was under communist rule, so everyone lives in apartments. Everyone had to be the same. But when you get out into the villages, then you get into the homes, and they have, they have yards so they can grow things. And, and we admired their, their grapes. Well, what did they do immediately? The moment we said, oh, we should, what beautiful grapes you have. They immediately go and cut them down and start washing them, and next thing you know, they're bringing us grapes. That's a generous heart. It's a generous spirit. It's a heart that says, I want to give. Such kindness touched me. And I trust that as we honor the Lord in such a way, that we will minister to others. And that our attitude toward money and our attitude toward generosity will be used of God in a powerful way. I pray that he will use you and I 
to bless those around us. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for your provision in our lives. And we pray, O oh God, that you would be first and foremost in our hearts. And Lord, even in the area of money, how we earn it, how we spend it, what are our attitudes towards it, Lord, we, we need your help. Because we live in North America and there's so many values, Lord, that just don't always coincide with the Word of God. And we're influenced by those. I'm influenced by those. I saw that even when I was in Albania. I recognize things, Lord, that I have to say, oh, Lord, I give it to you. I want to honor you. I want to honor you with my wealth. And so, Father, help us, we pray in Jesus' name.